News breaks that the University of Kentucky has been performing gender change or top surgeries, uh, also known as breast removals, on minors, despite what Bashir has priorly stated that gender change surgeries on minors is not happening in Kentucky. Mackenzie Cameron launches Moms for Cameron, and a new pool regulation from the Cabinet for Health and Family Services has many pools around the state facing possible closure. We'll have all that and more today on the Andrew Kubrider Show. But first, like, comment, share, subscribe, uh, hit that hit that share button, hit that like button, follow, sign up for alerts, whatever you're doing, please uh, keep listening to the show, share it with others as well. Word of mouth is the best way that we can grow the audience here and spread the news that you all have been receiving every day. Once again, we release episodes every day, one o'clock. You can catch them on video format on Facebook and Rumble and YouTube and Twitter. And then also you can catch it in the audio only format on all major podcasting platforms, whether that is Spotify, uh, Apple, Amazon, iHeart, whatever it may be, we are there. And so please share this out, spread the word, and let's dig into it. So remember when Andy Bashir said that gender change surgeries on minors uh, weren't happening? No? Well, maybe let me remind you, because this was quite a long time ago, like as in uh, a week or two ago. In fact, right now, probably uh, this ad is still airing and you have probably seen it recently from the Bashir campaign. My faith guides me as governor and as a dad. I'm a deacon in my church and I believe that all children are children of God. These attacks on me by Daniel Cameron are not true. I've never supported gender reassignment surgery for kids, and those procedures don't happen here in Kentucky. When I took office, I vowed to support parents, because as parents, we know what's best for our kids, not politicians in Frankfurt or Washington. Those surgeries aren't happening here in Kentucky. That was his claim. See, uh, Cameron had been running ads, has been running ads, or Cameron campaign at least, that Andy Bashir supports gender surgeries for minors, gender reassignment surgeries. Something that, once again, uh, it, it doesn't really, I would say it doesn't really matter whether you're getting into hormones or surgeries. I think if you're about against both, you're probably against both. Uh, obviously, you have to buy into a line. I've said this on a prior podcast, that you believe you can pump a little girl full of testosterone or a little boy full of estrogen and think nothing bad is going to happen to them that's permanent and life-altering in order to think there's a some sort of moral difference between the two. Uh, but anyways, point is, is that this repeated claim uh, that he isn't for these surgeries, it comes from the fact that Cameron has been running these ads because he vetoed Senate Bill 150 in its entirety, never mentioning that he was against surgeries but for hormones. Um, of course, in his veto message. He says, I veto it in its entirety. No Democrat ever offered a bill to only ban the surgeries and that's it. But regardless, one of Bashir's defenses as to why he vetoed it and why he didn't uh, mention that he was okay with the surgeries continuing before that ad is because he says, well, it doesn't happen here in Kentucky. And you heard that in the ad he was just playing. It doesn't happen here in Kentucky. Well, it's some bad news for Bashir because it has been happening here in Kentucky. News broke recently that a University of Kentucky, which may I remind everybody, is a state-owned facility. That's right. This is technically your government. Uh, you can go into the ins and outs and say it's a hospital and, and it's self-sufficient or what have you. Uh, you know, we could argue to the cows come home, but at the end of the day, this is a hospital that is a part of our state government, like it or not, but it is. Anyways, um, this state-owned hospital uh, sent this letter to Representative Tipton. Now, Representative Tipton had asked uh, back earlier in the year, University of Kentucky, about these gender change uh surgeries, hormones that are going on, and specifically about the University of Kentucky Clinic uh, called the uh, Transform Health Clinic. And from their letter, 
this is what we have. It says, I would also like to offer some additional context and background regarding the project provision of care at the transform clinic. So this is the university of Kentucky transgender services clinic. Okay. Transform health, <laughs> transform health. Anyways, transform health does not perform genital gender reassignment surgery on minors. Indeed, these types of surgeries on minors are not considered best practice in the United States and are performed in this country very rarely. Now, Hold off here. Remember all these people, or maybe you don't, but I do because, uh, of course, I have to deal with these people all the time online that claim that claim that these surgeries aren't going on anywhere in the entire nation. There is no gender reassignment surgeries going on. These don't happen on minors. We're all just crazy people. In UK's own letter there where they're talking about genital surgery. So they're talking about chopping the genitals off or, or trying to uh, turn a turn a penis into a vagina. It's so stupid. We had to even talk about this. Anyways, um, <laughs> it's just, where, where have we gone? I never thought I'd have to be straight face talking about changing penises into vaginas about minors, but this is how far we've fallen. Anyways, so uh, try to not. I'm going to try to to recollect myself and remind myself that this is a serious news story and that we don't live in a crazy world. So they would claim that these surgeries are not happening anywhere around the nation at all. Many uh, Facebook comments and arguments have made this very same claim. But UK right here is admitting that obviously these genital surgeries have been going on. But what do they say next in the letter? Well, it says Transform Health has in recent years performed a small number of non-genital gender reassignment surgeries on minors, such as mastectomies for older adolescents. Like any surgery at UK healthcare, these are performed only after careful medical evaluation, discussion, and the consent of parents and guardians. What they're talking about there is performing so-called top surgeries on minors. This is either giving boob jobs to boys or uh, removing healthy breast tissue from women. And in this case, underage boys and girls. That's right. University of Kentucky in this letter is admitting that in recent years, they maybe possibly have done a few surgeries on minors, either giving them breasts or removing them as an attempt to treat their mental health problems as identifying as a different gender. Uh, pretty extreme, if you ask me, of course. Uh, you know, I I'm, I'm, don't have to claim to be a mental health expert to know that, generally speaking, giving boob jobs or removing them to uh, removing breasts on teenagers simply because they believe they're a different gender and need this surgery so they don't kill themselves is probably not the best way to be treating somebody with a mental illness. But putting that to the side that clearly flies in the face of these gender reassignment surgeries. University of Kentucky in that letter is admitting that they have done so-called top surgeries on minors as a part of a gender reassignment process, not done as cosmetic surgeries. They're not talking about giving uh, a, a boob job to a 17 year old girl. That's not what they're talking about in that letter. They are specifically talking about, and I read it to you. You saw it. If you're watching, they're talking about giving these surgeries to people of the opposite sex uh, in order to make them look like another gender specifically. That's the reason why. So, so-called not happening in Kentucky. Bashir's giant claim. Oh, this ain't happening in Kentucky. Well, Bashir, it looks like you've got quite a lot of egg on your face because clearly they were happening there in Kentucky. But I have just one question. Because remember, what started this whole conversation with me, or if you remember my prior podcast, I talked about this article here, uh, where Joe Sanka wrote one of the worst journalistic articles I'd ever seen that lacked any kind of facts, where he was, funny enough, pretending he was fact-checking a GOP ad, uh, and it says, fact-check GOP ad mislead by suggesting Bashir supports sex chain surgeries for kids. Now, the entire crux of the argument, the entire crux of Joe Sanka, 
Smith's argument was based around the idea that these surgeries don't happen in Kentucky. Why? Well, because the argument by Joe Sanka and Bashir was that, well, the only reason Bashir hadn't brought up the fact that uh, he was against these surgeries, these gender reassignment surgeries on minors, is because simply they weren't happening in Kentucky. And your ad's misleading because if they are happening in Kentucky, I would totally be against them. I never saw a reason to say it because they weren't happening here. Well, Bashir, looks like they were happening here. And my question would be, do you think we are dumb enough to believe you didn't know that? Do you think either either you are unaware of what's going on in state-run hospitals and you didn't bother to ask your uh, helpers as you're going through and deciding whether or not, because you say you're against this gender reassignment surgery because it's so damaging to children. And when you were looking at a bill and decided you, you didn't need to sign into law at least the part that said that these surgeries can't happen, you decided you didn't want to do that. And you just claimed blindly these surgeries weren't happening. You had nobody on your staff go research it. Is that what you want us to believe? Or is it much more likely you would rather hope that this never got discovered in the first place, that we never found out that, in fact, these surgeries were happening in Kentucky? My question for Joe Sanka, now that once again, uh, it has been proven that his journalistic integrity is just not there. And instead, he hasn't been doing the hard work of a journalist on articles like that, of verifying his facts, instead relying solely on this idea that these surgeries weren't happened, so Bashir just didn't need to talk about it. My question for him is, when's he going to fa fact check that political ad I played for you at the beginning? When's he going to print an article that says fact check Bashir's ad misleads by claiming gender reassignment surgeries don't happen in Kentucky. Do you think we'll ever see that fact check from Joe Sanka? No. Of course not. Of course not. Because that is, that is not how it operates. We know that the Courier-Journal is operating in Joe Sanka as a member of the Democrat Party, uh, as a member of the Bashir campaign. Because if he was an honest person, and was an honest journalist, he would now be printing an article that says, fact check, Bashir lied. But I don't think uh, we need to hold our breath waiting on that. We'll probably all suffocate. Well, coming up after this, uh, Cameron's wife, Mackenzie, launches Moms for Cameron. Uh, we'll be covering that. What is the, the angle here? What is the uh, message you're trying to put out with this. Uh, we'll be covering that right after this short break. Mackenzie Cameron launches Moms for Cameron here over this past week. Uh, let's take a look at that launch video. Kentucky is an amazing place. It's where I grew up, went to college, and met my husband. Daniel and I are raising our son Theodore here because Kentucky is home. This year, we have a critical choice to make about the future of our Commonwealth. Becoming a mom has taught me patience and service and has given me a glimpse of the kind of love our Savior has for us. It has opened my eyes to the importance of electing strong leaders like Daniel, who will fight for our kids. Daniel and I believe in strong families and their power to strengthen Kentucky. Every Kentucky mom wants to ensure their children are protected and that our Commonwealth is preserved for their futures. When our shared values, faith, family, and community are threatened, we say not on our watch. That's why I'm proud to announce the launch of a new coalition, Moms for Cameron. We will not stand by while radical ideas are imposed on kids in classrooms. We do not accept the drugs and crime ravaging our streets. And we will not allow our young women who love sports to be degraded. We are Moms for Cameron, joining together to elect a leader who will fight for safe streets great schools in a brighter Kentucky. Too much is at stake in November, and I ask you to join our coalition today. So that was the launch video for Moms for Cameron. Now, this is obviously a push by uh, the Cameron campaign to try to bring in more of the family type issues. See, that is the main defining factor between Bashir and Cameron. And that's what they're going to have to lean heavily on. See, the fact of the matter is, is that 
while uh, the, the economy arguments are just not good arguments. They're not. They never have been. And I know Republicans want to sit there and claim like, oh, yeah, they're super great arguments. They're awful arguments. Take a look at this so-called red wave we should have had in 2022. Now, we had a red wave in to a degree in certain areas, but in, it certainly wasn't as large. We didn't win the Senate like it was possible to do. And, and a large part of that is because of the Republicans insisting on focusing on things like the economy. The fact of the matter is, is that when it comes to crime and the economy, voters don't care. They just don't care. You think they can, it has to get so bad for them to care. Look at the times where economy actually flipped voters onto Republicans. Look at how bad it was when that happened. It has got to be in the tank. There cannot be a single possible bright light within the economy at all anywhere in order for them to finally recognize Democrat policies as being as bad as they are when it comes to the economy. And the same goes for crime. Point in case evidence of that. Look at all these gigantic cities have ravishing crime, horrible economies. But yet time and time again, what do we see? We see the voters there voting for Democrats because these are not actually good and winning issues. These are not, they don't create an emotional response from people. See, Democrats for a long time have done a good job of getting that emotional response from individuals. And now it's time for Republicans to do the same. And when they do it, they win. Take a look at Virginia. People want to say that these social issues aren't important, but literally talking about schools is what caused uh, Governor Yunkin in Virginia to win in the first place. Take a look at Florida, a former purple state that's now bright red because DeSantis did the work on the social work. It wasn't just about economy and jobs and crime. Those things are great and, and they help improve and they add to the point that you can continue voting for him safely, but it is these social issues. And the hope is with this monster Cameron push, they will be looking at those social issues, the real differentiator between Bashir and Cameron. The economy isn't a good, uh, it just isn't good there. It's just not. Big part of the reason why is because Bashir can claim all these successes within the economy, things that if they are successes, and, and I'm going to push back on that here in a second, but if they are successes, you would honestly then look at the legislature that's creating the budget, promulgating the regulations and laws that, that have created this situation, but then also at the same time, they're the ones who are voting to give these gigantic financial handouts to companies uh, to allow them in and also to then the local governments. Bashir has little choice, little decision in that. He's really not a large part of it, but he will claim it as his successes, as any politician would. But I, I would push back that they're actual successes. And this is one thing uh, that I wish the campaign, the Cameron campaign would look at. And this is a big part of, I think, Cameron's problem. Last night, me and my wife were actually talking about this. She asked, you know, why, why, why are people even thinking of supporting Bashir? What's the issue here? And, and I said, fact of the matter is you have this red state that went so far for Trump. Why? Because he speaks to the issues people care about. Why does a Democrat even have a shot in a state that went so far for Trump, whether or not he's the incumbent? And it's because people are asking themselves, what is a substantial reason to show up to the polls? What is the actual threat to us? You want to look at COVID, but people forget. Remove COVID and the average voters looking at it and saying, I, I don't really know what the difference is between Bashir and Cameron. Because the truth of the matter is, when it comes down to economic policy, there isn't much of a difference. And I know everybody's going to want to make a big to-do about it, but at the end of the day, I look at some of the things that I disagree with on the economic standpoint of Bashir, the massive handouts, talking about $410 million to Ford, $130 million to another uh, company making batteries, um, tens of millions of dollars of financial handouts, carve-outs, grants, so on and so forth, all coming from us, the taxpayer pockets. And I ask myself, will Daniel Cameron actually do something different? No, of course not. You know how I know that? Because most of those handouts were voted for by a massive majority of both the House and the Senate. That's not going to be any different. So if I'm a voter who actually is looking around saying, I don't like the way the economy is going, it's not, quote unquote, working for me, well, voting for Cameron isn't going to be a response to that. I'm not going to get an economy that more so, quote unquote, 
favors me. And what I mean by that, of course, is an economy that uh, doesn't continue to focus employment and power into uh, a few hands of corporations, but instead works for the small business owner and the middle class. And I don't mean that in the way the Democrats mean it, where they want government to come in and, and make sure that they're providing jobs. Because once again, that's focusing power into these giant corporations. What I'm talking about is the industrious middle class that I am seeing disappear more and more every day. I see more and more these small mom and pop businesses closing their doors. I see it. And I understand why I'm a business owner myself. My industry that that I mainly am focused in isn't as hard hit uh, right now and we're able to thrive. But uh, you can see time and time again that these individuals are having a hard time. And it is because the corporations are driving up the cost of everything, whether it's cost of labor, cost of doing business. Uh, it, it is not a, a rising tide raises all ships, but it's really not raising that industrious middle class. But I don't think Cameron's going to do anything different there. I, I don't even think Cameron realizes it's a problem necessarily, or if he does, I have never heard him articulate it. No, when I'm looking at the Cameron campaign and comparing it to or the possible Cameron administration and comparing that to the Bashir administration, what I'm looking at or looking for is the only actual difference that I think exists between the two, which is on these social issues. I think that bleeds into somewhat how a Republican governor would have handled COVID differently than Bashir. I don't think initially they would have handled it differently. And you just need to look at all the Republican governors around the state and save a few. They all behaved exactly the same way as the Democrats did initially. I think it was the extended uh, lockdowns and, and, mass mandates and those types of things that comes from having a Democrat governor that a Republican governor wouldn't have done. And I think that also goes into these social issues, but the social issues are the difference and they're winning issues. It's been proven. Like I said, when we had these senators and, and these congressmen that we told focus on, not we obviously I didn't, but they were told focus on the economy and crime. That's what people want you to focus on. They lost. But then when we see people who focus on these social issues, they win and they win big. When big. So with the Moms for Cameron launch, hopefully they're saying we're going to focus on some of these social issues because this is the real frustration to hit upon. The real unharnessed frustration is from your average taxpayer being afraid to send their kids to school. They're not afraid to send their kids to school because of personal safety either, you gun grabbers. They're afraid to send their kids to school because they're worried about what they're being taught and who's teaching them. They feel less connection with their schools than they ever have before. Uh, point in case, the fact that the legislature had to pass a forced public comment period law on school boards to ensure that they provided a public comment period and didn't push adults uh, out from being able to comment about the schools that they're funding and their kids are going to or other people in the neighborhood that are funding it. They weren't allowed to talk about it that public comments time was often cut out or cut short and it forced them to pass a law. That is point in case that parents have found themselves more at odds with the schools. I think harnessing on those types of issues could certainly resonate with a lot of individuals. And I've said it time and time again. When you go out to these rural areas where Democrats used to be in a stronghold and now it's Republicans and you ask them why they switched, it's not the economy, it's not crime, it's not drugs. It's none of those things. It has to do with the fact that the social issues are making them realize they do not have the same values as the Democrat Party of today. And making sure you point out that Bashir does not have those same values, I think, is incredibly important. While at the same time, painting Cameron as somebody who is very inspiring, somebody that you want to show up and vote for. For those of you listening that think to yourselves, how could anybody not want to vote for Cameron or how can they not think it's important? Let me ask you a question. Why should people vote for Cameron? Like, actually, why? And now we may say things about COVID, but leaving COVID to the side, ask yourself why. Out of this, we're going to talk about a new regulation being promulgated by the Cabinet for Health and Family Services that is leading to a lot of pools looking at possibly shutting down. We'll have more after this. A new regulation from the Cabinet for Health and Family Services has several pools across Kentucky looking at permanently closing their doors. 
This year, the Cabinet for Health and Family Services put forward a regulation that requires any pool with 2,000 or more uh, square feet of surface area to have two lifeguards on duty at all times while people are swimming. And this has caused a big problem for a number of pools. One, there is no carve out in the regulation for pools like uh, the pool at Lexington Athletic Club, for an example. That Lexington Athletic Club, that is a lap pool or at your local YMCA. A lot of those are lap pools. And at lap pools, you'll see a surface area more than 2,000 square feet, but you only maybe have five to 10 swimmers at a time actually swimming in the pool. And certainly one lifeguard could get the job done. But under this regulation, they're requiring two. In fact, at the Lexington Athletic Club, how it used to be, they could put up a sign that says nobody under the age of 18 should be swimming without an adult and then be perfectly fine not having a lifeguard at all. But under the new regulation, you can't do that anymore. You have to have a lifeguard, even if you have a, a, a 10 full adults swimming in a lap pool at their own risk, taking on their own risk, consenting to it, you can no longer have a lifeguard there. And what's drive, you, you can no longer not have a lifeguard there. And what's driving this? Well, we've recently seen an increase in drownings. In fact, in the state of Kentucky uh, has now the highest percentage, not the most amount of drownings, but the highest percentage of drownings with children. Now, I would say that and you'd say, well, geez, we must be having thousands of drownings a year. We are more having around 50 or so drownings a year in total. Uh, it fluctuates. It could be a little bit higher. And then a percentage of those drownings, about half, are children or children under five. Pretty significant amount uh, that you see. And they're looking at um, ways to kind of help with the drowning issue and this regulation uh, that's being enforced by your local health departments is what they've decided to do. Now, this wasn't passed by legislature at all. And the enforcement body, your local health departments are not even elected by you, the people, the voters. It's kind of crazy to think that there's an entity that can control literally everything you eat, everything you drink, controls your pools, controls your restaurants, controls your supermarkets, literally controls everything. And it's board that isn't voted by you. In fact, depending on where you are, it's not even appointed by people who are voted on by you. For example, the election health department is self-appointing. There is one seat on there that is appointed by an elected person. And that one seat that is appointed by an elected person is a non-voting member appointed by the mayor of Lexington. It's a completely unelected body accountable to nobody other than regulation promulgated by the cabinet for health and family services, who is also not elected. In fact, uh, this past week, we talked about the chair of that, um, the secretary of that, uh, being incredibly incompetent <laughs> when it comes to getting children off sleeping off floors and uh, how they're appointed by the Bashir administration. So you don't even get to somebody who actually has decision-making power that is elected uh, over your health departments in, in a lot of cases until you're probably five or six bosses above your actual local health department. That's pretty extreme. And that causes these situations where they put out these uh, regulations without really thinking about how they affect. And you have a number, a number of pools. So let's say they're not just a lab pool. Let's say they did have a lifeguard there for 2,000 square feet uh, or more of surface area, but it was a complete square. If you have one person swimming in 2,001 square feet of water, you now have to have two lifeguards. They simply cannot afford to survive. But this isn't the first time we've seen a lot of government overreach over children drowning. In fact, in 2022, uh, we saw House Bill 196. House Bill 196 wanted to require that if you had a pool, a pond, a lake, didn't matter. If you had standing water on your property and you had less than five acres, you had to, within 120 days of it passing, build a fence around those structures or fill them in and tear them down. So every homeowner who had less than five acres that had a pool or a pond or a lake, a treated pond or a lake, uh, would have to put up a fence. Why? Because one child one time wandered onto a property and fell into the pool and drowned. Now, obviously, uh, requiring homeowners to make their property safe for a child that it may be trespassing because their parents aren't watching them on their property does bring up a lot of cost factors. And I feel awful about that child who did drown. But at the same time, Passing regulations based on that emotional connection just doesn't, it just isn't good policy. On top of that, we're avoiding a large part of what could be causing the problem. So as I said, we in Kentucky have seen a large amount of drowning, uh, but we 
we aren't asking the question of what is causing that. In fact, this rise has been recent. And take a look at this uh, headline from 2021. This headline is from um, WBKO. And it says, Kentucky drownings on the rise attributed to kayakers and canoeing. In fact, Kentucky does have more miles of running water than any other state in the country other than Alaska. So out of the lower 48, it's got the most amount of running water. And so there we're seeing another cause for what could be causing this rise in drowning, these rivers and these lakes. Have we really looked into uh, the amount of opportunity that provides is that what's causing these rise in drownings? Or is it the fact that we don't have a lifeguard on site at some of these places? And let alone two, have we taken, we, we pass a, they put forward a regulation. Clearly they didn't ask for public input from anybody who actually works in the pool industry. There would have been a, a lot more pushback on this, certainly. But on top of that, uh, what we see is a regulation that is so costly that it's causing pools to shut down completely. And I guess that is one way, if you're trying to accomplish children never drowning, is to just uh, administratively close all the pools with your costly regulations. Certainly unintended consequences or maybe intended consequences. Well, guys, that's what we have time for today on the Andrew Cooperwriter Show. Thank you all so, so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your day. Remember, tune in tomorrow.